The Old Testament tells us concerning the death of the Messiah that one of the results is the title on your outline today, He Will Save from Death. Let's talk about death for a few moments. And I know it might, it seems awfully heavy. Like, man, it's early and it's daylight savings time. To be hitting something so heavy. Let's talk about death. Do you, um, do you think about yours? I mean, have you ever really stopped to consider how you're going to die? I mean, none of us know. But have you thought about that? How am I going to go? Is it going to be an accident? Is it going to be disease? And then we consider, uh, have I thought about when am I going to die? Because I know storybook, we all live to be 120 years old and we die peacefully in our sleep with our loved ones around us, but that's a rare occurrence. How many more days do you have left? And you're like, well, Pastor Jeff, I was in a good mood before I came in here. I'll just be honest with you. I don't know how people don't think about death. I don't, know, I don't know how they don't think about it. Because despite all of the medical advances that we have in our day, the death rate is still 100%. I looked that up. And you know, not just the medical advances, diet and exercise. You could be the healthiest person in any room with a meticulous diet, and, and you're, you're working out five hours a day, and you're going to be a really fit corpse someday. Because even, even as healthy as you can be, you're still going to die someday. The death rate's still 100%. And, and, then, and then we come into church, right? Oh, we talk about death in church, but we get all theological about it, right? that death came into the world because of sin. And just as sin has passed from generation to generation, so we all die. Is it appointed unto man once to die? Um, 1 Corinthians um, 15, 26 says that death is the enemy. But let's be honest, my friends. Death is not just a point of doctrine. Death is not just a, a page in a theology book when it's someone close to you who dies. Then it becomes something much more emotional, doesn't it? Whether it's a parent, a spouse, a baby. Maybe a very close friend who passed away. Maybe it's a pet reminding us of the horribleness of death. And somebody might say, well, I don't know if you should be putting pets up there with people. Look, we, if you're a pet person, you get it. We love our pets. And I don't know if I've ever cried harder in my life than when my dog died. But in any case, death always seems to come too soon. Whether it's the car accident, the motorcycle accident, the overdose, the heart attack, even, even old age. If that's the cause of death, that even then it seems too soon. And there's just not a thing we can do about it. But there was something that God could do about it, and he did. So let's talk about the cross in Exodus chapter 12. 
Same three questions on every outline this month. The first question is this. What is the prophecy of the Messiah's suffering? What is the prophecy of the Messiah's suffering? Well, Genesis 3.15 was a promise of the suffering of the Messiah. Exodus 12, the Passover, was a picture of the suffering of the Messiah. And to give you a little bit of an on-ramp, just a, a uh, sort of a biblical review, this might be new information for some of you, and that's cool, but um, Israel was slaves in Egypt. And God sent Moses to lead Israel out of Egypt and into the promised land. But you remember the guy in charge, Pharaoh, he wasn't having it. He wasn't about to let his slaves go. So God sent nine plagues on the land, and Pharaoh still would not release Israel. And God said, okay, this is Exodus 11 now. God says, okay, I'm sending one more. And when I send this one, he is going to drive you out. And the 10th plague was the death of the firstborn. That God said he was going to come through the land of Egypt and he was going to kill the firstborn in every home. But God made provision for his people to be spared from this plague. And that takes us to Exodus chapter 12. Let's just look at the first, <clears throat> excuse me, 13 verses. It says, the Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, this month shall be for you, beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. Tell all the congregation of Israel that on the tenth day of this month, every man shall take a lamb according to their father's houses, a lamb for a household. And if the household is too small for a lamb, then he and his nearest neighbor shall take according to the number of persons, according to what each uh, can eat, you shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male, a year old. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats, and you shall keep it until the 14th day of this month when the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill their lambs at twilight. All right? Now look at verse 7. Here's what we do with this lamb. Verse 7, it says, Then they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and the lintel of the houses in which they eat it. They shall eat the flesh that night, roasted on the fire with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. They shall eat it. Do not eat any of it raw or boiled in water, but roasted. Its head with its legs and inner parts. And you shall let none of it remain until the morning. Anything that remains until the morning you shall burn. In this manner you shall eat it. God says, okay, here's how you eat this lamb. In this manner you shall eat it. With your belt fastened, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. And you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. Well, what, what does that mean? Here it is, verse 12. The Lord says, For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And on all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. The blood, you know, the blood that was painted on the doorposts and the, and the cross piece, the lintel. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood... I will pass over you, and no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. Okay, so Israel was told every household, quick paraphrase, was to take a spotless lamb, kill it, and put the blood on the doorpost and the cross piece. And God says when he passes through to kill the first born in every household. When he sees the blood, he will pass over and spare the firstborn 
from death. And this Passover event was to be remembered throughout the generations of Israel as a sacred holiday. You can read about that, Leviticus 23, Numbers 9, Numbers 28. God wanted Israel to remember this event because there was a very important lesson that God wanted his people to learn, and that is this. When you're covered under the blood of the spotless lamb, you're safe from death. That was the message of Passover. So generation after generation, this is what was taught to the children. Hey, when you're covered under the blood of the spotless lamb, you're safe from death. Dad, why are we celebrating Passover? Well, let me tell you what happened. You know, the door frame was painted with the blood of the spotless lamb. And when you were covered under the blood of the spotless lamb, you were saved from death. That was the lesson that was being taught for generations. So number two on your outline, how did Jesus fulfill this prophecy on the cross? We probably are starting to connect the dots. But do you realize the sacrifice of Jesus was carried out perfectly according to God's sovereign plan, including, and this is absolutely mind-blowing, including when the crucifixion of Jesus took place. This was no accident. Do you realize the moment that Jesus was crucified was the very moment that the Passover holiday was being celebrated in Jerusalem? That's in Matthew 26, Mark 14, Luke 22, John 13, all four Gospels. That tells me it's important. While Jesus was on the cross shedding his blood, The Passover was being remembered and celebrated. Oh, and what was the lesson that was being repeated regarding the Passover while Jesus was on the cross at that very moment? It was still being taught. When you're covered under the blood of a spotless lamb, you are saved from death. And it was on the cross that the spotless lamb of God, Jesus Christ, shed his blood to save us from death. I can barely wrap my brain around that. That God in his providence orchestrated the sacrifice of his son to be with this holiday. But God took it a step further. To really, to really pound the nail in, I want you to see th- this. This is something so profound that the Lord did to prove that Jesus Christ is the Passover Lamb. John 19. We're going to have this on the on the uh, screen here for you. John 19 verses 28, 29. Look at these verses. Jesus was on the cross being crucified for our sins at this very moment. It says, after this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said, now look at this parenthetical phrase under inspiration of the Holy Spirit. It says, uh, he said this in order to fulfill the scripture. He said, I thirst. A jar full of sour wine stood there, so they put a sponge full of the sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. Keep that verse up there for a second. Because this is absolutely staggering. Jesus, in order to fulfill the scripture, said, I thirst. This is actually the shortest statement that Jesus made from the cross. It's, a, it's one word in the Greek. And Jesus said, I, I thirst. <laughs> right now you might be like, okay. I was tracking with you, Jeff, but you lost me there. You're saying this is so profound. But everybody gets thirsty. What was so profound about Jesus being thirsty? I mean, obviously, with the beating that he endured and the blood loss and this public execution, he was obviously dehydrated. I mean, it's really not, it's really not that profound that he was thirsty, was it? <laughs> 
This could be the most profound thing that Jesus said on the cross. Because what Jesus was doing here, even while he was being crucified, was recreating the Passover scene. Because I want you to look very specifically. It says, so they put a sponge full of the sour wine. Look at this, look at this. On a hyssop branch. Very specific. I mean, they they could have put the sponge on anything. But very specifically, they put it on a hyssop branch. And you're like, What's the deal, Pastor Jeff? You're a gardener now? You're into botany? What's the big deal with the hyssop branch? Well, to know what the big deal is with the hyssop branch, you've got to go back to Exodus 12. Remember when we read Exodus 12 together? That was a good time. That was just a few minutes ago. It's daylight savings, I know. I know. I'm still trying to wake up to. You go to Exodus 12, 22. Look at this. Look at this. Israel is told how to apply the blood on the doorpost. Take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood that is in the basin and touch the lintel and the two doorposts with the blood that is in the basin. The blood of the spotless lamb of the Passover was to be applied specifically with a hyssop branch. So let me ask you this. These Jews in Jesus' day that knew their scriptures, and they certainly knew all about the Passover. They were in Jerusalem celebrating the Passover. What do you think it would have looked like to them when they saw a hyssop branch extended? What do you think they would have thought of? That reminds me of the hyssop branch that Moses said to apply the blood of the Lamb. So you see, God was proclaiming, God was graphically portraying in this scene, this is the true spotless Passover Lamb. This is the true Lamb that saves from death. And it's a staggering thing to see that God providentially uses what looks like a simple act, giving a drink, to actually be the playing out of the events of the original Passover, showing us that the original Passover events were actually a foreshadowing of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. Man. That is absolutely incredible. But we can't uh, close the book on this topic without asking our third question. What does this prophecy mean for us? Like, okay, Pastor Jeff, you connected some biblical dots for us. Appreciate that. But what does this prophecy mean for us? Here's what it means. Listen, last week, if you were here, um, we saw that uh, Satan is defeated And we said, he's still here for now, but he's defeated. And I was thinking a lot about that this week, and I thought, you know what? Death is the same way. Death is still here for now. There's still physical death. But like Satan, death is defeated. Like Satan, it's not to be feared. And like Satan, will soon be done away with forever. Revelation chapter 20. Oh, I love Revelation chapter 20 so much. And uh, one of the best verses in there is verse 14. It says, then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. The day is going to come when God says the concept of death no longer exists. It is over. There is no more death. And until that day, those of us who have received Jesus Christ, who have believed in his name, we have no fear of death. 
because we are under the blood of the Passover lamb. So, like Israel, God will pass over us in judgment, and we are going to be saved from death. That's what that means to us. But you know, when we talk about death, so many times throughout my ministry I've been asked, even by Christians and even by Christians that have been sitting in church every week, like, okay, I, I understand, you know, uh, yeah, that Jesus died for my sins and I'm not going to not bear the, the wrath of God for my sins, but I just got to know what happens to me when I die. Because death hasn't, physical death is still here for now. So on your outline, I'm going to go through these quickly. Because there might be somebody here asking this question. Here's a question. So what happens to me when I die? What happens if you're a born-again believer in Christ, if you've received him? So what happens to me when I die? I want you to write three things down here. Letter A, you don't. You don't. I mean, not really. Because look what Jesus said in John eleven twenty five. 25. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. This is what Jesus said to Martha. This was uh, Lazarus' sister. And this was right before Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. And I love this because Jesus didn't merely say to her, hey, hey, Martha, don't worry, I can raise the dead. He could have said that, and he would have been right. But that's not what he said. He showed us a much deeper truth, and that's this. Jesus said, I am. the resurrection, and the life. That second part of that sentence, though, he's, or the second sentence, excuse me, says, whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live? That's what you need to know, believer. What happens to me when I die? You don't. Though you die, you will live. And death for the believer is really just a change of addresses. But again, notice the first part of that sentence, Jesus said, whoever believes in me. The Bible doesn't give any hope for the person that doesn't believe. If you have refused to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, if you have refused to bow your knee to him, I don't have any hope for you today. And the only thing you can expect from God is his judgment. So I have to ask you, do you believe? Have you received Jesus Christ? Have you thought about everything that means? And has belief in Christ forever changed the way you view life and death? Because in reality, in Christ, when you know him, we anticipate our death. Because though we die, yet we live. So what happens to me when I die? Well, in Christ, you don't. Uh, letter B, uh, you go immediately to heaven. I get asked this a lot. What happens to me when I die? Do, do I, where, 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 where do I go? Well, if you have received Christ, if you are under the blood of the spotless Passover lamb... You go immediately to heaven. Philippians 1, 2, 3 says this. It says, um, my desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. 2 Corinthians 5, 8, yes, we are of good courage and would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. There is no intermediate state. There is no soul sleep. There is no spiritual waiting room where you 
go when you die and you just got to wait for all the end time stuff to happen so you can get out of the waiting room. That, that, none of those things are biblical. What I see biblically, according to the Apostle Paul, under inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is that he was convinced that as soon as he died, he was immediately in heaven with his Lord. You know, Jesus indicated the same thing in the story of the rich man and Lazarus in Luke 16. You can read that. But the Bible teaches uh, when a believer dies, he lives. And I would um, also include the biblical concept, uh, he lives immediately in the presence of God. So what happens to me when I die, uh, you don't. Uh, you, you go immediately to heaven and then finally... You get your, uh, you eventually, excuse me, you eventually get your glorified body. 1 Corinthians 15 says, When the perishable puts on the imperishable, and the mortal puts on immortality. What's, What's he talking about? Someday you're going to get a new body. And if you're like me, you can't wait for that. I put too many miles on this one. (laughs) And I don't have the option to trade this one in at the dealership. Someday you're going to get a new body. We did a whole sermon series on this. If you go to our website, harvestpittsburghnorth.org, look for a a sermon series called Because Jesus Was Raised. And we talk all about this, but I'm going to give you the short version as it applies to our uh, subject of the day. But the short version is this, that the rapture, The Bible says the dead in Christ are raised. Then the alive, those still alive at his coming, to receive a glorified body that we will have for eternity. That's the short version. But going on here in 1 Corinthians 15, he says, look at this. He says, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And I wanted to share these verses with you because I want to show you how death is defeated. We've been saying that this whole sermon, right? Death is defeated, death is defeated. Like, well, exactly how? What's What's the mechanics of that? How does that work? He tells us here exactly how death is defeated by Jesus. Look at these verses. Can we keep those up on the... Yeah, we have them up on the screen. Thank you very much, A.V. Um, First of all, it says death is swallowed up. And I love that. It doesn't just say death is injured or or death is hurt. Death is a boo-boo. Death is consumed. He says, oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? That word for sting is the same word that the Greeks would use for bees. So using that picture, death has a stinger. And the stinger is gone. I love this picture. He's sort of portraying death like a Bee. Have you ever been stung by a bee, ladies and gentlemen? Isn't that delicious? Death is like a bee. And he's saying that the stinger was removed at the cross. And soon, the whole bee is going to be swallowed. Like, well, what, what does that mean? He gives us the explanation here. Verse 56 He says, look at this, the sting of death is sin. You see that? The sting of death is sin. My friends, death has no power unless there is unforgiven sin. And if you die with unforgiven sin, then death is eternally deadly. And then he goes on to say the power of sin is the law. What does that mean? Well, it just means that sin 
has been defined by the law. Do you know why God gave us the Old Testament law? It was to show us exactly why and how we are sinners. And this is how the victory works. This is how the death of Jesus Christ defeated death because the Bible says the wages of sin is death and Jesus paid the wage. See, when Jesus Christ was being crucified, what he was doing for you and I was satisfying the demands of God's law. So when you receive Jesus Christ, for you, death is just a bee without a stinger. And what's a bee without a stinger? A glorified housefly? More annoying than anything. And that explains why Paul taunts death. He says, death, you got nothing. You got nothing. I'm not afraid of you. Oh, I used to be afraid of you. But there's no stinger, and the whole thing's going to be swallowed up here soon. I'm not afraid. That's why he says, the very last phrase there, he says, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And every time I read this passage, I think of the same thing. Jane Hour knows exactly what I'm going to say. Because I think this every time I think about this passage. I think about um, Michael Jordan in 1990. In 1990, Michael Jordan scored 69 points in one game. And it was a career high for a stunning career. But the same night that Michael Jordan put up 69 points, he had a rookie teammate named Stacy King. And he came into the game late, and he made a free throw. Well, you can imagine the post-game press conference. All the reporters were going after Michael Jordan, right? But Stacy King was able to get a comment in. And he said, I will always remember this as the night that Michael Jordan and I combined for 70 points. <laughs> you see, that's what God's saying here at the end of 1 Corinthians 15. God gives us the victory. Who did the heavy lifting? Jesus Christ did the work. We get the victory. So yes, you're, you're like Mr. King. You have victory. But it's only because someone else did all the work. Our Passover lamb defeated death. And when you receive him, so have you. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I don't know how we can respond other than shouting praise and thanks and adoration unto your name for your wisdom, for your sacrifice, for your providence, God, you, for your mercy and your grace that you have chosen to not hold our sins against us, but you were willing to sacrifice your own son as the perfect Passover lamb so that we could be saved from death. Thank you, Father, for the victory. Thank you for the confidence that we can walk before you as victors uh, like, like Stacy King. Not really because of what we did, but it has everything to do with what someone else has done. So, Father, at this time, let us stand up and let us shove everything out of our minds right now except praising and glorifying your name for what you have done. 
through Jesus Christ, our Lord, our Savior, our Passover Lamb, we pray to you. Amen.